If you have any questions, put them in the chat. So as, as the talk's going on, uh, feel free to put in your questions and we'll come to those at the end. And uh, there'll also be opportunity to put your hand up at the end as well. So I think that's kind of the basic stuff done. Um, so firstly, our, it's a real pleasure to introduce Seth Davis from University of York. Um, I've been interacting with Seth now for just a few months, but I've been very much aware of the work that he's done in circadian clock genes for for a number of years now. So it's really nice to have him here uh, giving us a talk. As a quick CV, uh, Seth's background was a degree in Florida, followed by a PhD at the University of Wisconsin. And from there, he then moved to the UK in Warwick and as a research fellow. And then he took up a research leader position in Cologne. And then after that, in 2013, he moved back to the UK and took up a chair in plant biology at the University of York. So Seth's uh, lab, amongst other things, we were here just a little minute ago, amongst other things, he works on the circadian clock function in Arabidopsis in barley. So the circadian clock in plants is one of the, the most important molecular mechanisms uh, in plants. It regulates, I'm, a, I'm involved in plant gene expression, so I know it regulates the biggest daily changes in gene expression, and it coordinates also seasonal changes. So mutational changes in circadian clock genes have led to some of the most important adaptations to new environments of our crops. So I think we're gonna hear a little bit about that from Seth today. So I'm just gonna stop there and I'm gonna pass over to Seth in his presentation, exploring the photoperiodic clock in grasses. So I'll pass over to Seth. Thanks, Seth. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and put this on the first slide. Yes, um, thank you for the invitation in this um, IBS, IBH, um, I guess I shouldn't say IBS, uh, <laughs> IBH uh, seminar series. Um, when I was thinking through what I wanted to talk about today, I decided um, um, that my original talk title had um, kind of the concept of wheat and brachypodium in it, but I decided instead to focus more on barley, but just orient what some of the challenges are, I think, um, that the clock can help mitigate in barley. And all of my seminar, I know not everyone here is a molecular geneticist, but this is kind of a punchline of, of the general theme that I want to do and then how we can exploit this. And this is the general idea that um, winter annual barley coming from the Fertile Crescent, depending on how you want to count, anywhere between 20,000 and 40,000 years ago, moved to temperate Europe and became spring barley. And we now know through um, genetic studies over the last five or six decades, and also now molecular genetic studies, the three major genes were involved in this transition. Um, genes called VERN1, VERN2, which I'll briefly mention, um, which are, I'm not an expert in, and then a so-called um, seasonality gene in barley, PBDH1, um, which is a key determinant in allowing barley to over summer, that is, exist within temperate European climates, which are cool relative to where it originally evolved from, but also with the extended light that we have um, at our extreme latitudes we find in European climates. So this is what I want to talk to you about today, is um, what does it mean to be a seasonal gene in barley, and how might we move forward uh, in thinking about this. So I think a lot of breeders, this is probably, or a lot of farmers would kind of ask this question uh, when they're thinking about when to drill barley seed. And that is, would you want a winter barley or would you want a spring barley? And I'm probably the least expert of this entire panel today in this decision. But if we do think about, you know, the major difference, of course, is that winter barley is predominantly living its growing life during um, having more darkness and less light over its light life, whereas spring barley would be living its life where days tend to have more light and less darkness in them. If you go through these kind of um, shopping lists of things that you would care about, uh, we do have down here this idea that a major difference between winter barley and spring barley is that winter barley has the ancestral wild type PPDH1, and spring barley has the derived, um, not loss of function, but reduction of function PBDH1 gene. 
So the reason why I became involved in this and why I think the group at the James Hutton and internationally is aware of our work is because PPDH1 was showed by Dave Laurie's group before he um, went to retirement at the um, John Innes Center that it is the barley orthologue of an Arabidopsis circadian clock gene called PRR7. And this leads to a major question, what does it mean to be a circadian clock gene? So what I'm gonna do in my next 10 slides or so is just go through the history of the plant circadian clock, just to thinking about some of the, the concepts of that, just to help the barley community think about what is a rhythm and what do they mean and how can we exploit this? So this is um, kind of undergraduate lecture slides that we're gonna have for the next 10 or so, just thinking about clocks. So I'm gonna start at the beginning. And whenever you start at the beginning, you start in the Bible. So this is chapter one, verse one of the Bible, uh, the King James Version. And you can see the very first thing that's mentioned is time. Time is the beginning of everything as it comes to the Abrahamic religions. And um, after time was um, the separation of the light dark environment. So, so time and light and dark are the most important things that orient our concept of understanding the evolution of the earth. And I think um, that's a reasonable thing to consider. Uh, in, in, uh. The other thing, of course, is that um, light is good. Um, and I think, generally speaking, Barley would agree with that. So I think Barley generally likes um, as a photosynthetic autotrophic organism. And this is kind of where um, plant circadian people think about the clock, and that is that we have predictable rhythms that exist because of the rotation of the Earth. So um, any terrestrial organism living more than a year will spend exactly half of its life in the light and half of its life in the dark. Um, as we move away from the equator, that changes seasonally, um, but averaged over the year, it's still 12-12. And the predictable environmental signals that occur because of that rotation of the Earth are the light-dark cycle the warm cool cycle and much less understood is the wet dry cycle, the humidity rhythms that are generated by these two rhythms here. We do know that these humidity rhythms um, do function in the oscillator and they do contribute, for example, um, to transpiration rhythms, but that's poorly worked on. But the business end here is that inside a plant cell is a circadian oscillator. One can think of this as a biochemical machine that has a kinetic enzyme rate of once per day, okay? So that is, you have um, a biochemical process that tells the plant what time of day it is. If we look at latitudes such as we are here, uh, I'm in York and you're, many of you are in Dundee, but I think most of us are away from the equator. Um, we're September 21st, we'll have the day that has the largest photo period change. And at our equator, or at our latitude, one day to the next will be seven minutes different. Okay, so the circadian oscillator needs to be reset by these environmental signals as an organism responds to changes in photo period. So if tomorrow is going, the sun will rise seven minutes later than it did today, the oscillator doesn't have a purpose uh, without knowing what the light dark cycle will be. But this is the thing I think that most breeders would be interested in. That is, what does the circadian clock do for the plant? This is a bit of an academic exercise. What are the genes that make the clock? But this is the business end, right? All of these kinds of traits here contribute to yield, either directly or indirectly, either by creating biomass or determining when in the season a plant flowers, when the leaf senesces to remobilize nitrogen to the seed, uh, and also importantly, the clock contributes to abiotic and biotic stress tolerance. So um, plants are um, preventing the ability of damage to occur based on the expectation of the time of day, for example, that an aphid would um, suck phloem sap. Okay, so this is the, the argument that the circadian clock is an important thing to work on, but that we need to work on how environmental signals are perceived, what the oscillator is, what the clock does, but importantly, from a pre-breeding perspective, where is the genetic variation that occurs in each of these three steps so that we can actually improve um, barley yield in a changing climate. So the 
plant circadian clock has been studied for as long as natural sciences has existed. So the Greeks were already working on endogenous rhythms that occur in plants, particularly rhythms of leaf movement that occur in many um, dicot plants. And one of the very first controlled scientific experiments, this is an experiment that actually goes through the idea of um, set up a hypothesis, design an experiment, conduct it, and see if the experiment either supports or refutes the hypothesis, was the idea that plants have an endogenous rhythm for leaf movements, um, and that what um, Jean-Jacques was doing was he was putting plants in a box, a dark box, and then pulling them out every now and then and showing that the leaves continued to persist with a variety of control experiments. Um, he was murdered during the um, French Revolution, as essentially every French academic was, and that actually slowed down the circadian rhythms research until this guy got involved, and that is Charles Darwin. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, the last publication of Charles Darwin was a book with his son, Francis Darwin, who also became um, a fellow of the Royal Society, called The Power of Movement into Plants, and it's a fascinating book that does things like um, predict auxin in the colloidy went hypothesis, um, but um, also doing things like looking at root architecture and growing plants. Um, but Darwin, both Darwins were quite fascinated with rhythmic movements that occur in many plants. That is, plants do not grow continuously, but have times of day that they grow. And that was followed up by the grandfather of um, circadian rhythms research, Edwin Booning. And I'm sure everyone here can read the German here for this classic paper. But what's really interesting here um, is this is, you know, the uh, circadian rhythm of phase. So this is um, broad bean um, has genetics to it. So he was already saying in 1932 that there was a genetic basis for rhythms that occur in plants, which is quite an amazing thing to have been said. This was people were still debating heredity at that time, nevertheless, to say that it was involved in behavioral manifestations. So this is the kind of um, uh, another person that you're quite familiar with. Um, this Carl Linnaeus has come up with binomial nomenclature. But he was also a quite renowned botanist who, for example, was looking at petal opening. And he created what was called the flower clock. That is that if you were growing these plants in your garden, and you just looked at what time of day the petals were opened or closed, that would be sufficient for you to know what time of day it was. So the opening and closing of these petals was not based on um, the environment, but rather the time relative to dawn. Um, he never actually grew one of these flower clocks. Other people have, and you'll quite frequently see in botanical gardens where you'll have a collection of flowering plants that if would ever once have their petals open or closed, will tell you the time of day it is. Okay, so back to booning. This is again the idea of what circadian rhythms are. So circadian rhythms are manifestations of a biological process that occurs once per day. That's what circa dia means, around the day. And what booning was doing is he was taking these um, bean plants. Um, for those of you who ever seen a bean plant growing in a greenhouse, it's quite amazing. The, the angle of the leaf can actually be about 90 degrees different between day and night. Um, you'll also see this in a lot of clovers, for example. So the legumes have quite dramatic growth rhythms. And what he did is he put a little string on the leaf, and then you have this spool turning around. This is the kind of thing that you'll see, like, detecting earthquakes in museums. But as the spool turned around, as the leaf went up and down, then it would cause a pen to move here. And this generates um, a trigonometric function. Right, so so you have um, rhythms that are occurring with, for example, a peak once a day, and this led to his um, nomenclature of what the circadian clock is, and this is what the whole community uses today. If you look at the last dark to light transition, dawn, we'll call that ZT zero, so the the point of the start point, and then you can measure, for example, how long does it take before some event happens, the acrophase of that event. It could be, for example, when petals open on a flower. And that's the phase. Um, now, if you put the organisms under free running conditions, um, we don't all have exactly 24 hours. So, for example, if I put Robbie in a box, 
he may go to sleep and wake up every 26 hours. But if I put Craig in a box, he may go to sleep and wake up every 23 hours. So we have genetic differences between us to determine our free running rhythms and plants do as well. Okay, so the amount of time that it takes an individual to get through a particular biological process. So one um, rhythm, so the one frequency of, of this time series um, is the period. And then the amplitude is um, one half the peak to trough distance. Okay, so these are the main things that came out of the kind of ideas of Booning's work. And his hypothesis was that some aspect of phase period and amplitude, um, each of those would be adaptive. That is that changing these things would confer um, a selective benefit to an individual within the environment it happened to find itself in. Okay, so um, coming back to now that we're leaving the kind of history of circadian clocks and coming back to barley. So the question, of course, is what does the circadian clock do for barley? So um, as Craig mentioned, there are a number of molecular rhythms that occur. So um, Lukas Muller, who was a graduate student with um, Maria von Korf and myself, um, did a large RNA sequencing of barley. So barley plants that have been grown under light dark cycles and put under constant light and constant temperature and replicate samples were harvested every four hours. RNA was extracted and then cDNA was generated and sequenced. And from rhythm detections, um, about 10% of all barley transcripts can be rhythmic. So several thousand genes. So that's actually quite a bit less than other plants. So in general, the um, wheat, barley and brachypodium genomes are less rhythmic than other plants, and we certainly see less um, rhythms of, for example, in growth and development. So leaf growth, for example, isn't rhythmic in barley, whereas it is in many other plants. But these molecular rhythms drive large-scale metabolic rhythms. So essentially, the whole of primary and secondary metabolism in barley is rhythmic. Um, that, of course, makes sense because um, light capture to generate ATP is going to happen during the light intervals, and respiration during the evening is going to happen um, when light isn't present. Uh, one big difference between barley and, for example, the brassicas is that barley is predominantly generating rhythmically um, vacuole or sucrose for its energy reserves in the night um, compared to um, sucrose, I'm sorry, starch um, deposits that occur in leaf in, um, in the brassicas. And that's actually the main determinant of why um, rhythms don't exist in barley leaves. Barley leaves are rhythmic according to the coolness of the evening because of the amount of vacuole or sucrose that is excreted. So um, a major developmental trait for barley is the transition from vegetative to reproductive development. Um, so when in the season the plant transitions from stop making leaves to start making flowers is um, a major thing that we see uh, genetically in barley. So uh, what is the genes for the oscillator? Um, almost all of this is based on work in Arabidopsis. So with apologies, I'm going to show you some um, Arabidopsis genes and then show you what's similar and different um, between the Arabidopsis oscillator and the barley oscillator. For those of you who are not familiar, Arabidopsis is um, a crucifer. This is in the mustard family. And it's related, for example, to canola or turnips or other uh, broccoli, um, Chinese cabbage. So um, an, it is an important uh, crop in the UK, um, particularly around the vegetable market. Uh, Arabidopsis also tastes good. I've eaten it. Um, so it, it tastes like broccoli. <clears throat> so um, this is probably the first molecular experiment that was ever done for the circadian clock in plants. This is work done by Ferenc Nagy when he was a postdoc in Nam Chua's group. And it was done in wheat. So in fact, actually the very first circadian molecular biology experiment um, in plants was looking at two light regulated genes that are involved in photosynthesis. We now call these genes LHCB genes. And what he was doing is he had um, these run on northern blots here where he had extracted RNA from wheat plants that were going through light dark cycles or kept in constant darkness. So this is subjective day. The plant thinks 
that it should be in the light here, but the light never came. And you can see that the, you have light comes on, the gene comes on, so it's a light induced gene. But even as the light stays on, you see a decrease in transcript accumulation. So the plant is predicting darkness, so the gene is coming off before it becomes dark, it stays off during the midnight hours, but the gene is coming on before the light is coming on. So even though it's a light induced gene, you have a rhythm of expression. The light didn't come on and it still continues to be rhythmic. So this is a manifestation of um, an RNA expression rhythm. Um, Andrew Miller then, who was a graduate student with Nam Chu at the same time, decided to take a transgenic approach and started putting reporters behind promoters. So the same CAP2 gene of Arabidopsis of the gene in wheat, he put against um, an enzymatic reporter gene, made transgenic plants, and the transcript for this reporter continued to be rhythmic compared to control transgenic transcripts. So that led Andrew to um, make a real innovation for the circadian community. This was originally done in plants, and that was to generate um, the promoter luciferase system. So in Arabidopsis, about a third of all transcripts are rhythmic, and about 10% of all transcripts are rhythmic because of promoter initiation. So you take a promoter from any circadian rhythmic gene, make a trans um, cryptional fusion to the firefly luciferase gene. This is the gene that um, encodes the enzyme that causes the, um, the lightning bug, it's back in to glow in the evening time. So if you make transgenic plants with this, then they will become rhythmically glowing in response to the transcript accumulation generated by um, the promoter. So what we have here, these are four clusters of Arabidopsis seedlings that have been um, with transgenic either with a promoter of LHY to luciferase or CCA1. These are two genes that are expressed in the morning. CAB, this is a gene that's expressed in the middle of the light of the day, and CCR2, this is a gene that encodes a protein involved in cold stress responses. Um, the plant is predicting that the evening will be cooler than the day, so every day you have an increase in the expression of um, evening cold responsive genes. These plants were set for seven days to 12-hour light, 12-hour dark cycles under constant temperature, and then released to constant light, constant temperature. And once an hour, a photograph was taken. And then I generated this movie from that. And you can see that these two genes here come on first, and then this one, and then that one. And these are clusters of seedlings that are right next to each other. Okay, So we don't have this technology yet in barley. We do have a companion non-transgenic approach called delayed fluorescence, um, which um, in Soon I'll be able to start reporting on. We have it working quite well now in barley um, to be able to look at rhythms in living plants without grinding them up to look at RNA in them. Okay, so using this kind of approach, um, what Andrew did is he mutagenized these to look for mutants that were altered in their rhythm profile. So in each case, the black is the wild type. So you have a rhythm of bioluminescence, and he found mutants where the period, that is the distance between peaks, was accelerated, so these plants have a fast clock, or plants that have dampened oscillators, or plants that have slow clocks. So you can get all kinds of rhythm perturbations. Um, these kinds of mutants then were used to clone a bunch of genes, and ultimately that led to um, uh, a couple different things being able to be done. One was Anthony Dodd, when he was a postdoc um, in Alex Webb's lab, decided to test Booning's hypothesis, and that is that the circadian clock being 24 hours is adaptive. So now that we have mutants where the clock is running, where the, the mutant thinks the day should be a 20 hour day, or a mutant thinks the day should be a 28 hour day, you can start growing plants under fake days. So this is a 10 hour light, 10 hour dark cycle. So um, for those of you who don't know, when um, crop plants first came about, the earth had um, a rhythm probably of about 23 and a half hours. So friction is slowing down the speed of the earth. The ancestral circadian oscillator of plants, the earth would have been um, about 12 hours. So, so the, the earth is constantly slowing down. So these, it's not um, completely fake to think about, you know, where the earth might will be 100 million years from now. Okay, so if you grow the fast clock mutant under this fake short day, or the slow clock mutant under the slow day. What Antony found was that the short period mutants grow better under short 
days and the long period mutants grow better under long days. And he found that the major differences here were associated to water use efficiency. And it is, um, it looks to be one of the most important things the circadian clock does. Okay, so the clock is important for plants. Okay. So um, I won't go through this in too much detail, but just to say that there, you get into genetic logic very quickly. And that is once you start cloning these genes, you can look at reciprocal transcript accumulation of one gene and another gene's mutant background. So for example, here we have a loss of function in talk one where they're looking at the accumulation of LHY and CCA1 transcript accumulation. And the key observation here by David Alabadi when he was in Steve K's lab was that the overall amount of transcript was less than the wild type. And that here in overexpression of LHY and CCA1, that talk one transcription was off and then an important mutant called L3, um, that the TALK1 expression was high. And using these kinds of data sets, without going into details, people started making first genetic models of the circadian oscillator, so where you'd have MIB-like transcription factors expressed in the morning, repressing a gene so that it's off during the day, that the repression would be relieved, allowing for evening expression, and that the accumulation of this transcription factor then would induce this. And this has been the entire hypothesis about what circadian oscillators are, and that is their transcriptional, translational, auto-feedback regulators that generate these kinds of rhythms. They also bind to thousands of target genes, and this is what generates um, the wide-scale rhythms that Greg had described in the introduction. Okay, now talk one. Um, was originally found in these mutational screens, but it was also identified as a gene family in plants. And it is resembling a set of gene products that are now called pseudo-response regulators. Now, that's important for you to remember because the very first slide I had in here, I told you that PPDH1, the main um, seasonality gene in barley, is a pseudo-response regulator. So it sits within this family. So Takishi Mizuno's lab looked at the five pseudo-response regulators in Arabidopsis, looking at RNA expression. He's nicely colored these for us, so that way we can see um, when they're expressed. And you can see that PR9 comes on just after dawn, and then PR7, and then PR5, and then PR3, and then PR1. So this um, kind of makes this nice little color wheel, and it led him to create this kind of bucket brigade hypothesis of how pseudo-response regulators work. Uh, this is not what they're doing, but it, it again just illustrates that different gene products have expression patterns at different times of day to have different manifestations of the outcomes. Um, where important gene products for the, this talk will be these morning express pseudo response ligators, PR9 and PR7. So, another gene product that my lab has worked on for a number of years is called Early Flowering 3. And as the name gives away, it's a mutant that flowers early. So it's on the tin, right? So what early flowering three does is the plant thinks it's always in summer, even if it's winter, okay? So if you grow Arabidopsis under a summer photo period, 16 hours light hours or darkness, it has an inductive photo period. This is a long day plant. So we'll only make six or seven leaves before it transitions to flowering. Whereas if you have a non-inductive photo periods at the same temperature, the plant will not transition to flowering. It'll make 30 or 40 rosette leaves before it transitions to flowering. And one genetic screen that can be done, this was done by Rick Amasino at the University of Wisconsin, was to look for plants that, when grown under summer photo, uh, winter photo periods, resembled plants that look like um, grown under summer photo periods. So these plants don't know what season they're in. And what my lab and other labs showed is what's wrong with this. This is um, some work from Nora Bedoza, former postdoc of the lab, is whereas wild type has a rhythm, um, what's wrong with L3 is that the plant is arrhythmic. The plant doesn't know what time of day it is. If the plant doesn't know what time of day it is, then the plant always thinks it's summer. Okay. Um, importantly, also, she could show that the pseudo-response regulators, PR9 and PR7, have very high expression, and that'll be important for my discussion of what PBDH1 does, okay? So um, I'm not gonna go through mathematical equations, so um, I could spend uh, an entire seminar just putting up Greek alphabet to you to describe where all these arrows come from, but importantly, 
we have a very good idea in Arabidopsis of the molecular architecture of the circadian clock and that this gene product here, L3 and L4, would directly repress these two morning express pseudo-response regulators, 9 and 7. And confirmation of that hypothesis from Ava Herrero and Nora Bedoso is that if you give too much of these gene products, then these PR9 and also PR7 stay very low. So L3 is a direct repressor of these morning acting genes. So an evening expressed protein is a repressor of a morning expressed gene. Okay, so that was all the introduction I had to orient what is PPDH1, okay, as the Barley community thinks about this. So again, Dave Laurie showed that PPDH1, uh, so had worked on a number of genes, VERN1, VERN2, and PPDH1, as a very, very quick introduction to VERN1 and VERN2, they express transcription factors that are required for the plant to know whether winter coldness has happened. This is a completely different process in winter. Two pieces of information exist to the barley plant. One is, has it been cold continuously for months? And another is, has um, the plant been exposed to uh, extended amounts of darkness and relatively short amounts of light for many days? So the VERN1, VERN2 pathway, they're quite well known, and they're also quite well understood in how they transition the plant from vegetative to reproductive development in response to extended coldness. People have already started making nice little cartoons, largely based on work from Caroline Dean at the John Innes Center about what happens in Arabidopsis. But there are key differences in the Podiaceae and how this pathway works compared to the Brassicaceae. So um, people work on that as well. But coming back to photoperiod sensitivity in the PPDH1, what we have is the ancestral state. This is a plant that rapidly flowers um, in response um, to um, extended um, vernalization, um, which replaces it. Okay, PPDH1, the spring allele, um, the plant it, sown in the spring uh, is a late flowering mutant effectively. That is the plant has, it will flower in the absence of vernalization. And what PPDH1 does is it keeps the plant from rapidly cycling under those re no requirement for inductive. And what a lot of early maturing mutants, so you can mutagenize spring mutants and fine mutants that cycle very rapidly, um, they then um, increase the expression of PPDH1 um, to allow rapid cycling. Okay, so this is kind of where I want people to be thinking about as we move forward, thinking about barley breeding. And that is as barley is moving into um, ever increasing uh, latitudes, both in the northern and in the southern world, um, barley will have to continuously be moved away from the equator as a response of the warming from climate change. Um, again, what we have here in these more tropical climates um, is that generally speaking, or at least certainly ancestrally speaking, um, winter barley is predominantly growing under the wet winter months. Summer, of course, is very dry and very hot. So if, as an annual plant, it wouldn't survive the heat and lack of available water in the summer. Um, as we move to more temperate climates, then you, you want to benefit from this long growing season. So that's one of the magic things of spring barley is that you know, you can have the 16 hours of light and you get all of that photosynthetic potential, particularly with um, the water availability that we will have uh, in European climates. But as you move to even higher northern latitudes, you have actually a, a dramatically reduced growing season because um, spring frost and early onset of winter would dramatically reduce the capacity of having a barley growing season. So you can't have these um, sp normal spring alleles. You have to have these early maturing spring alleles to be able to fit in that growth season within. Um, um. Okay, so just putting this back on the European map. So we have again here, winter barley became spring barley. Um, but um, probably about 120 years ago or so, people started working on um, germplasm in a, a gene product called early maturing 8, which is also called MAT-A1, 
Um, and this is allowing barley to grow in um, Scandinavia and also um, continental Russian climates, uh, with the idea being that you need to have early flowering in the background of a late flowering barley plant. Um, and what Maria von Korf did is she collaborated with Dave Lorry to show that this early maturing line that you can find in spring barley germplasm is the barley ortholog of Arabidopsis early flowering three. So certainly the photoperiod pathway and the inductive long photoperiods seems like they're both requiring these um, evening uh, proteins. So um, I just want to keep beating this to death to thinking about what these different climates would look like. So again, you know, what would you have in um, annual um, barley growing over the winter and in the ancestral state or spring barley? So nice um, picture here of um, a nice environment. You might want to grow such plants like this. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and again, what you'd have is you'd, you'd be um, sowing these seed um, to have this nice extended growth season over the summer before you have this autumn harvest rather than the spring harvest. Um, but when you grow these under extreme northern photo periods, you need to compress the growing season to be able to get yield before the onset of winter. And that's why you need these early maturing lines. Okay, now it's not just an increase in latitude that does this. We also see EM8 is an important variant in altitudinal variation. So this is the Tibetan plateau in um, China, and they have essentially the same latitude, but you also will have this early onset of winter, and they've also introduced early maturing eight um, alleles, so um, having uh, rapid cycling alleles in a spring barley background to lead to barley cultivation under those kinds of climates. Okay, so uh, again, I'm not going to go through biochemistry and cell biology, but just to orient what we know in Arabidopsis, L3 is a protein made in the evening. It goes in the cytosol and in the nucleus. It shuttles between them. And as you get into midnight hours, a small anchor protein is made, which increases the protein concentration of L4 and L3. Um, and then this increased protein concentration asso assembles to an anchor uh, to a harbor protein called LUX. And then you end up with this tripartite protein structure, L4, L3, LUX. And these three proteins together bind to transcription uh, to promoters to cause transcriptional repression at their target genes. And I'm telling you all this because these are the key genes that occur in the barley photoperiod pathway, um, L3, LUX, and the pseudo-response regulators. So based on this hypothesis, Maria had hypothesized that the lack of L3, uh, here she's calling it the barley L3 mutant, um, would have increased expression of PPDH1. So what happens to spring PPDH1 in, for example, Bowman or Golden Promise is that you have this transcript accumulation. It's a very broad transcript accumulation that occurs um, peaking around dusk um, and this protein that is made from this transcript has a mutation where it is less able to bind DNA. So if you were to increase dramatically the amount of this partially functional protein, then it would allow it to, to have a proper function. And that's indeed what Maria found is that there was extremely high levels of PBDH1 transcript, allowing it to um, the spring allele to have induction of this. And a major set of data that are coming out is testing this hypothesis, is PPDH1 actually a circadian gene? We know that the spring allele in barley does not have circadian phenotypes, but what we don't have in barley is loss of function to PPDH1, so removing this gene product. Um, and this is where um, I was going to say a little bit about what's going on in Brachypodium, which is a weed that is in the family of barley, and also um, and tetraploid uh, wheat, so pasta wheat, um, people haven't done this yet, and bread wheat, is the idea that um, loss of function in these genes should actually lead to um, very late flowering, and that L3 should not accelerate that.
Um, it people always might want to hit mute on their microphones as we progress forward in this conversation. So um, just a little bit further in the academic exercise here, um, we know that the barley circadian oscillator and also work from Alex Webb's slab that the wheat circadian oscillator cannot be the same as that in the brassicas. This is just one example of such data. So as we have an Arabidopsis and increase the these part, this is um, a, a reduction of function allele. This is a strong allele. This is a null allele. And you can see that as you go from the wild type to these increasing alleles, you end up with this particular transcript is going up, up, up. Okay. And the equivalent in barley, it goes down. So we don't know what the barley oscillator is yet. Um, as Craig mentioned, it's something that um, he and I are interested in, in thinking about is what is the barley oscillator just as a, a fundamental level? And also how does that oscillator respond to um, changes in um, seasonal availability of environmental cues? Okay. Okay, so just to finalize my talk now. So as I mentioned, we have a pretty good idea of what the circadian oscillator is in plants. We have light represses this evening uh, complex as it's called through what are called phytochromes. These are red far red light photoreceptors and that these repress. Okay, so a business end of all of this conversation is these repressors of repressors, L3, Lux, and phytochrome. And why I'm telling you about these three gene products is that they're important breeding alleles in pre-breeding stocks in barley to think about L3, Lux, and phytochromes. So Maria von Korff and I have been thinking about what are all the genes that could potentially make the barley oscillator. So there's a lot going on in that space for those of you who are interested. This is mostly an advertisement that that, that kind of work is ongoing. But again, focusing on the phytochromes L3 and Lux, you can see that they have barley names to them. That is that early maturing 5, early maturing 8, and early maturing 10. So these are existing mutations that exist in spring barley germplasm to allow early flowering. And this, they were originally um, characterized in depth by Robbie Wall as he was introducing all of the mutants that existed or QTLs that existed into the common Bowman background, which was of course a Herculean effort. So thank you, Robbie. Um, so I think the whole community is thankful for those Bowman integrations that exist for their favorite traits, okay? So I'm just going to go through some of these right now. So um, using uh, positional cloning, Maria von Korff was able to um, identify a candidate gene in EM10 as this transcription factor LUX, where there was a point mutation in um, the DNA binding domain of this. And again, this is the protein that would contribute with EM8 in repression of PPDH1 expression, okay? And indeed, we can see that um, PPDH1 is in elevated in LUX, as you would expect, as it was from EM8, and that morning acting genes also have. Um, and I think, um, is Kiara still in Dundee? I think she is, so I'm sure she's quite famous to you guys there um, who, are, who are up uh, in Dundee. Um, so this was um, a lot of work that she did in um, Maria's group. Um, EM5, this is um, early maturing five, is a point mutation in phytochrome C. Now this is really interesting from a breeding perspective. So first off, it's dominant, and dominant genetics are always difficult to interpret. But in this particular case, what we have is a point mutation that affects the encoded protein so that instead of having a phenylalanine at this position, you have a serine in this position. And what that does is it makes a differently functioning phytochrome. So what we know in Arabidopsis is that there's a, a nighttime gene that turns on L3 to make the clock run slower or to make the plant flower late. And in the daytime, you have phytochromes inactivating this, so you're repressing the repressor, which makes the clock run faster, which also causes the plant to early, uh, to have early flowering. So if you lacked phytochrome, you would have high levels of L3 and you should flower late. So why does this mutation um, cause early flowering? So the reason for it is that this point mutation causes the phytochrome to be dominantly active. So this is a gain of function mutation to put phytochrome in a locked position to constantly turn off L3. 
And we know that that's true, at least from the work of Brachypodium. And again, tetraploid wheat hasn't been looked at yet in barley or hexaploid wheat, because if you make um, CRISPR mutations in phytochrome, you get extremely late flowering. That is, the plants don't flower. Okay, so, so this is um, a quite different phenotype than what we have from the EM5, but it also allows EM5 to be thought of in hybrid barley contexts, because a founder line in any F1 cross will have a dominant gain of function early flowering phenotype. So I think that'll be really useful um, as different seed companies increase their um, availability to farmers of their hybrid barley stocks and the ability of using EM5 as a quite novel allele in such breeding programs. Okay, so a little bit more about L3 and EM8. So um, at the same time that Dave Laurie cloned L3 as EM8, the um, uh, Danish group head by Matt Hansen working at the Carlsberg Laboratories found a huge number of loss of function mutations in what they call MAT A, also called EM8. Uh, and in Dave Laurie's group, he was also able to characterize these. So almost all of the existing germplasm that exists within breeding programs today are loss of function mutations that cause early flowering. And one of the questions that's coming out, um, both from work in Dundee and also from the IPK in Gottersleben in Germany, is that we know that L3 in barley and in brassicas and many plants has quite enormous haplotype distribution. A number of groups now are integrating these alleles to see whether they, rather than having, you know, kind of a draconian effect on barley development, might be um, more in fine tuning specific developmental choices that occur in these alleles. So this is just, um, so this is Lukas Muller, former graduate student of mine and Maria von Korf, um, just showing what happens to barley when you have EM8. So when Arabidopsis has L3, it's horrible. I mean, it's a pathetic plant and it would not survive in the wild. Um, but what happens to barley when you have L3 is it looks like a barley plant. There's nothing specifically interesting about this plant. Um, in growth and in yield, um, except that it is early maturing. And that's in fact why it can be used as a breeding sock, uh, is because you don't have all these horrible elongation of leaves and quite terrible effects on, for example, disease susceptibility that you don't necessarily see in barley. So this is kind of coming to the end now, and then I'm gonna get into some more kind of philosophic things. And that is, um, we have a circadian clock and it controls everything. Um, growth, development, metabolism, um, and also aspects that I've not talked about, about water availability and high salt stress and a variety of um, um, agricultural concerns around nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium availability. But, you know, these three things all relate to each other. So change in metabolism, change abiotic stress signaling and the circadian clock, the clock changes these. So we see these as kind of three arms of a triangle and that, you know, as you start, um, fiddling with one, you fiddle with the other two, right? And all of this is a holistic process that relates to yield and barley. And that what we need to understand is how all three of these things contribute together. Okay, so um, so again, where should we, we be in um, barley breeding? Um, again, we had barley from the Fertile Crescent moving to temperate Europe and, and then moving to um, more Northern locales. And we want to move them even further. You know, we can already grow potatoes in Greenland, so it's already, um, you know, barley might be next. Um, so, you know, we need to get plants that can grow under a very extreme photo periods. Um, we know that the spring alleles allowing for the summer growth potential of plants under these more extreme environments will require the PBDH1 allele. So that can't go away. But what we need to do is put early maturing in the context of spring barley plants um, right now, that's been predominantly through EM8, which is L3. Um, in a UK-centric context, what we know in the last 20 years is that plants and animals are having to grow about one degree north compared to where they used to. So, you know, what used to be northern English barley is now southern Scottish barley. But there's knock-on consequences of being in a different photo period as you're migrating plants up this climate column that's happening here. 
Um, and any long thin country is going to be particularly susceptible to the negative effects of climate change. And breeding will have to consider about how we're going to adapt plants to these changing photo periods um, so that they can have their appropriate thermal growth patterns. So we need to find clock alleles to be able to move plants around the world. That's kind of my punchline of this whole conversation and everything I've been trying to say today. I'll thank you for your time on a lot of the work that I did in collaboration with Maria von Korf was DFG funded. Um, most of the funding in my lab right now is funded by the BBSRC with generous support uh, internally by the University of York. And hopefully I'm not too over time. I'm a little over time. It's not terrible. It's pretty good. Okay, thank you. And um, yeah, I'm happy to take questions. Thanks very much, Seth. That was a, a fantastic tour de force of circadian clocks and uh, how it relates to uh, barley. And uh, I'm looking to see. So the way I think we'll do this, if anyone has any questions they want to put in the chat, put them in and I will read them out. If anyone specifically wants to uh, ask uh, Seth a question directly, if they put their hand up, I should be able to see it and you can so ask a question. Robbie has a question I'll read here. Um, is there yeah. any evidence that the period of the clock has been optimized when breeding cultivars that are not common and different, but not all regions? So Robbie, that is not known in barley, but it is actually part of domestication of essentially all clocks. We know for the best example of this is in fact in tomato, where wild tomato had a fast oscillator and directly associated with the ability of tomato to grow under hotter, drier, brighter conditions was um, a delay of the speed of the oscillator. And that delay of the speed of the oscillator is directly connected to when um, water releases from the leaf and when carbon is taken into the leaf. So um, um, the circadian clock is in tomato the domestication target outside of fruit size. Um, in the cereals, um, we know that um, hexaploid wheat has all of the changes that I said here for barley, but they're all in promoter mutations because um, you need to change the expression of the gene products to work in a polyploid context. Um, there's an even greater issue in hexaploid wheat, and that is that you have all of these clock genes made in more copies. So why is the clock still 24 hours? Um, that's actually non-trivial. And people have worked on that quite a lot in polyploid brassicas, um, where we know that clock genes are more likely than the average gene to be retained in polyploids and contribute to why polyploids have um, responses that mimic what happens in hybrid vigor. So we know that hybrid vigor and polyploidy, that their benefits to plants are through the changes in clock gene expression. So um, so in that sense, we need to study the wheat clock also um, and understand importantly, the differences between barley and tetraploid and hexaploid wheat. So I'm not sure if I've answered your question anywhere in there, Robbie, but um, every single crop plant has a different circadian oscillator than the wild plant that it derived from. So that's a just so story. Okay, thanks. Anybody else want a question? <clears throat> Martin. Hi, Seth. Um, re really, really interesting talk. Um, you mentioned um, altitude at some point, right? Um, just on one slide, I think. And I would guess with altitude, temperature plays a really big role. Um, is is much known about uh, temperature entrainment of the clock in barley? Does it does it work as well as say in Arabidopsis? And are any genes known that are involved in this process? Okay, so um, warm, cool cycles under constant light will set the oscillator. So um, of barley, um, I think Ben Travakis has been largely leading those studies. Um, Daniel Woods, who is in um, Jorge Dukowski's group, has been doing some of that also in Brachypodium, as has Phil Wig um, at um, Gross Beer and has been working on that in Brachypodium as well. We're, we're assuming that everything that's known in Brachypodium 
um, from a genetic pathway will probably be the same in barley, although that is a trivialization of the importance of barley compared to um, a weed. Brachypodium is not actually that typical of a podie in that sense. Um, one of the things that temperature rhythms do in barley is they control rhythmic gibberellin. And um, a lot of the effects on the flowering time pathway in barley could be quite different than Arabidopsis because of rhythmic GA induction of FT, just to get into specific genes. The other thing to say is, is um, as you go up in higher altitudes, yes, it's cooler, but that's actually kind of the point of migration. That is, um, a given um, ecological plant wants to find a temperature it's happy with. And it can either do that by going up to a higher altitude or going to a higher latitude. But it's actually not changed its temperature when it's done that. What it's done is it's changed the timing of light availability or really important for altitudes. And I want to emphasize this, Martin, is that you have an incredibly high increase in light intensity and a shift from having far red light to ultraviolet light. So for anyone here who likes going skiing, you know that you're, even though it's really cold outside, it's really easy to get a sunburn, okay? And these changes in light intensity that occur at very small altitudinal differences will have profound effects on barley flowering time. And I'm not sure, I mean, maybe somebody here who works on barley can talk about what happens in lowland versus highland barley cultivation, but I suspect a lot of those differences are about light intensity differences. And probably also water availability differences that we don't really understand yet. Um, so just to recap my answer to your question, um, in Arabidopsis, in the wild, temperature sets the clock, not light. So this is a really important problem, actually. <clears throat> Thanks, Ed. Anybody else? So I have uh, one little question about the, um, describing the clock as controlling the uptake of water. How, how do you think it does that and why does it do it? Why is the clock controlling water uptake? Okay, so th these studies are um, exclusively done in the nightshades and in Arabidopsis, so I don't know that this is true in barley or in the cereals in general. Um, the aquaporins that are present in various cells are transcriptionally controlled by the circadian oscillator. And water uptake through the root becomes rhythmic through aquaporin rhythms misexpress aquaporins, you change the timing of water. Um, also, rhythmic leaf movement that occurs is because of transcriptional rhythms at the pedestal of um, the leaf. So um, that's why the, the leaves are rhythmic only while they're growing. When they've reached their maximum growth stage, there's no more growth potential because the rhythms are driven by changes in turgor pressure exclusively. So, so in that sense, it's a simple answer, and that is transcriptional regulation of whatever particular aquaporin happens to be in whatever particular cell. Okay, thanks. I mean, another thing, of course, is that stomatal guard cell opening and closing is rhythmic, and that will generate changes in the capacity of water from the root to go to the leaf. So the entire transpiration stream is rhythmic simply because of guard cell biology. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, any other questions from the floor? So I think we're we're just about there. So uh, just to say thank you to uh, Seth for giving what has uh, really been a fantastic presentation. Uh, circadian clock rhythms and the number of genes that they um, are involved in interacting is just mind-boggling at times. And I think you've put over, like, I, I certainly understand it a lot better than I did before. So uh, thank you for all that. So can everyone just kind of put their hands together and, and uh, thank Seth for his presentation? Yeah, my last comment on what you just said there, Craig, whenever plant circadian people talk to animal circadian people, they always want to know why is it so hard in the plants? So it's not just hard for the barley community to understand. Even circadian biologists of other systems think that what I just explained to you today is a lot more complicated than it needed to have been. 
Yeah. But this this is what evolution made, and therefore that's what we have to work on. <clears throat> okay. Um, just before we go, um, Don has asked me to remind you about the next uh, presentation in the seminar series. So that's going to happen on the sixth of October at two o'clock. And I think it's let me see what it says. So public breeding programs, cultivar registration system, and market development of malting barley cultivars by Anna Badia. So you'll be able to register for that through Eventbrite as well. So, so thanks for that. So um, that's us. So thank you very much. Thanks for everyone attending. And uh, thank you again, Seth, for a really fantastic presentation. So we'll speak to yeah. you very soon, Seth. Bye-bye. Thanks, Seth. Brilliant. Well done.